The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kev. Yeah. Oh, oh, actually, I should I should say Mullins. Mullins in mm-hmm. the back. Okay, maths uh, maths homework or, or just maths lesson. See if you can solve this. You got a pen? Uh, no. This, this is what us dads have to face with homeschooling. By the way, when when your lad comes down, he says and he says, "Can you solve the following equation?" Put it in front of me, son. Let's see what I can do. You lost me at the paper pass. Are you ready? Yeah. Five. No. Bra- uh, five in brackets. No. Five. Then in brackets, x plus three. Close brackets. Equals three. Open brackets, x plus nine. Close brackets. What's X? Uh, I would say six off the top of my head, looking at that. Kev, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I should tell you a couple of things. Oh, Kev. Is it right, first of yeah, all? Yeah, you are. It well, took me ages to work that out. I sat there looking at it, and I thought, I don't, I don't know. And I was taking uh, <laughs> four equals five million seven hundred and... And you've done it in seconds. Yeah, well, the thing is, I went through this with Rosa this week also. Uh, And I, I, like, algebra, well, maths was never my thing, to be honest with you. When I was in school, I got a C in in GCSE maths, but I was in that that level of class where the most you could possibly get was a C, you know, that was... Was that the troublemaker class? Yeah, a little bit. And um, I, and algebra was something that I was really bad at. But then when I became a um, developer, a computer programmer, that algebra became something that you you kind of got used to. A lot of um, kind of transcribing of numbers and letters and distribution and stuff. However, saying that, I have to say, I managed to, when Rosa showed me hers, I helped her with a... the easy bits, and then I was like, no, no I have no well, idea I, now. I, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm putting, Kev, I'm going to put you over there. It's a pile right up there, uh, the pile called the Smart Ass File. The Fuji Cast. <laughs> and you're right on the top of it, Kev. I am very <laughs> impressed. I have a brainy friend at last. <laughs> Uh, right, welcome to the FujiCast, you and your questions from our electronic mailbag, and of course also through the FujiCast private Facebook group that Captain Mullins is in charge of, um, that you're welcome to become a part of. If you'd like to send a mail through uh, the old-fashioned way, click at fujicast.co.uk. If you're not a Fuji film shooter, do not worry, a big community is what you'll find here, whatever flavour you shoot. Thank you to our friends who have now supported us on the Patreon. Uh, Kev's book of the week this week. What, what do we have this week, Kev? Oh, we've got a super book, Diane Arbus uh, Revelations. Oh, Diane Arbus. Mm-hmm. Um, and today we hear from. Oh, it's it's one of your favourite subjects. Your new film, by the way, Kev. Amazing. I, I didn't. For some reason, it didn't pop up on my um, subscription thing. I usually get yours immediately, but it. It obviously filtered you away from me the day. It came uh, out last yeah, week. well, I, I have a. There's a special setting on YouTube where you, you only <laughs> send it to people who understand algebra. <laughs> oh well, that would be the reason why then. Um, but uh, yeah, your new film's amazing. I love it, and the, and the. I mean, I, obviously the content's great, but also equally being a techie person um, with with uh, the way stuff's graded. I think the grading of it is great, and that shows the power of, of, of video out of the GFX. Does it not? Well, I suppose so. Yeah, although I have to say, I'm I'm uh, I'm uploading right now as we speak. I'm uploading the the bloopers version to the to the members part of the YouTube channel, and uh, and you, <laughs> well, when I look at it, I just laugh. It's you know, it looks nice and nice and clean, but then you think actually, it's a whole load of shit underneath. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um... <laughs> Uh, we, we've got a, another uh, a successful YouTuber is our guest today, <laughs> today Adam Carnatch uh, from First Man Photography. You're successful too, Kev. Um, but we were having a good old chinwag, weren't we, about uh, about subscriber numbers before we came on air, as they call it, uh, looking yep. at uh, some uh, some YouTubers. You you sent me one. He, what he, well, he's done about what six videos, and he's he's got six hundred thousand subscribers or something like that. Who, who was that again? Uh, what was his name? James Janney. That was it. James Janney. James Janney. Or it's probably Yanny. I don't know. Anyway, he's a British guy. But yeah, yeah James Janney. Uh, uh, hi, I'm James, a 20 year old with a love for entrepreneurialshipness or whatever it is. Um, five, 591,000 subscribers in 11 videos. Amazing, eh? Yeah. I've Good for seen, him. I've seen him somewhere before, though. Um, he's familiar. Um, but he reminded me a lot of Jay Shetty, who. Um, 
who, who's got a similar kind of presentation style. Not the same sort of videos at all. Um, they they do look entirely different. But uh, it's almost, if you close your eyes, you can you can almost you can hear uh, Jay mm. Shetty in 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 that. Mm. But anyway. I tell you what, I've been listening to. I don't really listen to many podcasts apart from uh, your the, the Photography Daily and and that's a bit. And I, I listen to Fuji Love podcast as well, and uh, that's pretty much it. I do listen to some dorky ones, but I've started listening to one called Art Juice. Art Juice, yeah, right, really cool. Okay. It's it, it's two two women, but they're painters. It's not art right. as in the generic art. It's art as in painting. So what do they do? Do uh, is it interviews with people or? Uh, well, they did. They did do an interview with Seth Godin actually a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but that's that's the only interview I've kind of come Hang across on, a bit. on so, there. So, so it's not it's not about art. It's two people that just happen to be into art that are yeah, they're artists and they talk about their business. It's a little oh. bit like this, really, but without the boring bits. Uh, you know, they <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they 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 talk about. So the last one was about Instagram and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And I'm yeah. not, I, you know, I've just I'm only mentioning it. I don't know them or anything. I'm only mentioning it because I I you know I, I found it interesting. And they they're struggling with the lockdown as well. So they're you know they've got one person with really good sound and one that's not quite so good because yeah. you know they're stuck somewhere else and uh yeah it's good but they they i don't know what their numbers are but they did manage you know when we did that vote for us on the british podcast awards thing yeah. uh, well they actually won something so <laughs> they must be doing something right <laughs> they, yeah people like them more <laughs> yeah all these people with high subscriber numbers and awards and it's not about like the that. subscribers kev less oh, people I... but more more loyalty that's what it's about Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know whenever you send me something, you say, look at this person. They've got a gazillion subscribers. But, and, I mean, the, the way to get a gazillion subscribers is to do stuff that's not always so creative. I mean, I know the ones you've pointed out are creative, but I keep coming back to those um, ASMR, AMSR. I always get it yeah, all the way around. Yeah. You know, where, yeah. where, where ASMR. The, I was, who was yeah. I talking to about this the other day? Oh, I can't remember, but I was talking to a photographer about this. And uh, I was trying to explain the one. I think we both watched this one where, where somebody's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views just for eating uh, a burger. And yeah. you, can, you can hear all that. Do you know there's an actual disease for people who do not like the sound of other people eating? Gemma oh. has it. She physically has to leave the oh, room. It's horrible, isn't it? It's, it's something. There is a name for it as well. Yeah. It? yeah. But, but good for these people. But those people that say it's not about the numbers, it's, you know, uh, I, it's it's that, they're the kinds of people that would say to you, oh, you know, I've got a million pounds in the bank, but it's not about the money. It's just about being happy. Money doesn't make you happy. I'm like, yeah, it does. That's Actually, all right when you've got it. When, when, when you haven't got it, though, that's, that's when you normally say it's not about the money. It's not mm. about the numbers. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, they're all good. When, they're all good. When they very much deserve their success. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> At least you hear the truth on this show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's going first. Shall I go first? Uh, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a very simple one. B Bill Brulette, um, who says, hello, this one's for Kevin. Um, just wondering what scanner you purchased. Thanks, Bill. Nice and simple. There we go. Told you it was a simple one. <laughs> Oh, yes, I got... Hang on a sec. Uh, yes, so I got the Epson Pro V, V600. Right. Um, which actually, I think, was about £250. Very, very, very good. However, the one that I was going to go for was the Pro something or other, which was about 1200 quid. But then, actually, I realised that, that was a ridiculous purchase to make because I'm not going to make any money out of it uh, yet. So I went for the much cheaper one, V600, which is great. It scans. It's got a um, cartridge for putting 35 mil. Um, uh, um, what do they call those things? Film strips or, or slides? You mean slides? Slides. slides yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's got all that, and um, it's great. It'll, it'll scan up to twelve hundred DPI, which Oof. is brilliant when I'm doing my my recolorizing yeah. stuff. Are you doing a you lot of that high now? Because you were you were, were doing it for people, weren't you? Yeah, I've done a couple for people actually. Funny enough, um, but nothing of of note. But I just enjoy doing it for myself. It's, yeah. it's great. Yeah, I I do. It's just nice. I like it. I did. Somebody <laughs> wrote on my YouTube video about colorizing or black and white pictures. Why would you do that? It looks much better in black and white. They deserve to be left in in, in their, their own general whatever blah 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 did, did you write back <laughs> i just i just replied saying yes, you know some people some people just enjoy it just yeah. live your life don't worry about it it's and fine. actually um, I, when you i must send you a real I, I must do this can i send you one of granddad's old shop out the front on my mum's uh, mum and dad's wedding day 
as she's getting in the car. There's a lot of it. Oh, and now, actually, no, you wouldn't be able to do that because there's far too much of it. You like a simple por- you like a simple portrait, don't you? No, no, no. I can do it. I'll do. It. I'm up for a challenge. Yeah, the more complex. I mean, you can do all of them. It's just you have to. Uh, you have to. Yeah, it's more more work involved. But yeah, I'll do it definitely. Do you have to guess on the colours? I mean, how would you know what? What what yeah. colour Grandad's signage was, for example? Well, yeah, you do have to guess. You have to guess to a certain extent, but you you know I would, you know, you look at kind of the decoration of the time and things mm-hmm. like. That. So when I did my my grandmother and my granddad and all that, I I I worked on the the memories that I have of the colours of the stuff they generally wore. <sighs> Um, when I did, there's a picture I've got of my granddad in the, in the army and, um, they are, there's about eight of them more, it's really faded old film. Um, so I looked up his battalion or I asked my mum what battalion he was in, where, where he was, he was in the desert rats. And, um, and so I figured out what color their uniforms would be. And then you, I saw on some of the, some of the guys, their, their uniforms was much darker. Mm. um and some for one of them it was just dirt and mud and everything so i kind of blended that in and then the other one was was a was an officer so different style different color so yeah that kind of research goes into it but it's it's yeah it's why it's i enjoy it i enjoy it you know things that you enjoy is good right yeah it's not all about the money in your bank (laughs) yes it is (laughs) my um my my florist friend Lindsay, managed to uh recreate uh, mum and dad's wedding bouquet uh, from a black and white photograph so that was sort of taking it into 3d then from wow. she said from the tones and the flowers that she felt were were being used at the time that would have been popular in the early 60s she she mm. she cre- recreated the bouquet for what would have been mum and dad's 50th wedding anniversary so i could put it on their grave um, yeah which was an amazing piece of work i mean she said i'm not sure it's exactly right it's ex- you know it's completely accurate but i'm but i'm pretty sure i'm close yeah and she did yeah, all the yeah, yeah. all the wiring and everything that I mean she she did it from a few photographs that I gave her really studied the photographs and then produced this like three dimensional this is this would have been I mean I, I said to her that's that's really a business in itself can you imagine that people saying can you recreate something from this photograph from from fifty years ago yeah well there, I mean in terms of yes I mean uh, physical things like that incredible but uh, colorization photos is quite yeah. big business yeah well, well, there we you go. Know? See all these all these strings to your bow, Kev. Right <laughs> well, from Facebook, you have the Facebook questions, don't you? Oh right, yes, I do. So um, well done to all of you that are still posting the questions in the in the right place on the Facebook group. Congratulations, big cheers, well done, happy days. Um, <laughs> let's pick this one from Steve. Steve Vaughan it says okay. underneath moderator with a coffee cup icon next to him, and it's he just says Instagram wheels. No, Instagram reels. Huh? What oh, are yeah. they, and who does them? Ah, well, we were talking about this earlier this week, weren't we? We were. Because uh, I've uh, possibly got a project to make um, some films um, that are made specifically for reels. So they're short, itty-bitty films, shorter than a story. Oh, and looky, you could almost say they're they're a reaction, Kev, to another well-known platform, All the Kids with a Z-Love. I think, Steve, it should be you and your good lady Sam doing lots of dancing. Well, in my mind, I think Instagram reels are for... People who aren't hipster enough to do TikToky, tick, tickety tock, or whatever it's called. <laughs> That's the one I meant, Kev. Yes, um, it's, it's trying to copy that, isn't it? Really, it's for grown-ups doing tickety tock. <laughs> well, in, in much the same way that the new YouTube Shorts. I mean, there's the the YouTube Shorts have really not taken. Um, they've not flown yet, but knowing something like YouTube, they, they they clearly will because if the platform want them to work, they'll make them work. It's early days. Yeah, well, if you're an you early say adopt, that, but if you're Google an, are very Google have got a big history of of putting projects out there and then uh, if it doesn't take off enough they just stop it they just delete it remember google the the google social platform whatever that was called google plus was it google plus yeah yeah Yeah. one day they just went nah (laughs) just deleted it press the delete button yeah i didn't really join in with google (laughs) plus well maybe the instagram reels and the youtube uh, thing is is similar yeah i think you're right Uh, are you thinking Uh, about doing something steve Steve might be, yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not Steve. I can't answer. No, I know. I'm behalf, asking like he's like he's able to talk. Can't you hear the other side? I can hear them he's, talking back. He's off. He's off for a walk. Can't you see him? He's doing. <laughs> he's, he's doing, doing six he's, miles today. He's doing, so he's one thousand yeah. miles. Bless he's got to do one thousand miles in a year. But unfortunately, he's chosen to do this when he's locked down. <laughs> so he's only able uh, ever to walk around his block <laughs> or to the allotment. <laughs> yeah, walk around your allotment uh, for an hour uh, with your money boots a bird. on. Where? Uh, oh, look at this. <laughs> Um, it always reminds me of that joke my son used to say to me. He says, um, my name is Bob. I'm a goldfish. And a goldfish has a memory of 
my name is Bob. I'm a goldfish. And a goldfish oh, that, has a memory of... My name is Bob. <laughs> that's a proper Alby joke, that one. Um, here's, here's, there, there's a few comments that have come in over the, over the last couple of weeks, and these are nice to read as well. Uh, Keith Fincham, the Darcy Padilla documentary and the linked interview with her, comforting to watch, because it made me question whether I'd uh, ever have the courage to tell such a story or to be able to witness and record and not to recoil or hide away and also to acknowledge how cruel life is for some. The compassion and love in that story, so evident in the photographs, moving, wonderful, beautiful, sad, all those words, yeah, very applicable to to that. Um, you're a, a massive fan of Darcy Padilla, of course, aren't you? Oh, huge. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and he summed up the, the, the project there really well. Um, so for those that don't know what it is, it's it's called Family Love. Just bang that into, into YouTube, Google, whatever. Family Love, Darcy Padilla. Um, the book is beautiful. There's a film on YouTube that is um, emotional roller coaster. Let's just put it that way. But yes, totally incredible social documentary. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, there was, um, there's uh, Paddy. Have you ever heard of Paddy Summerfield? Um, was he in the Proclaimers, the Eurythmics? No, no, no. no, no. Um <laughs> Uh, there was a Summerfield, you're quite right, in, in uh, not the Eurythmics, though. Uh, that was the Communards. Oh, Communards. Yeah. <laughs> you see, uh, we have all the listeners now will be screaming at their, <laughs> their, their podcast things. The Communards, was the Communards. Was it Summerfield, though? Uh, Jimmy, was, Somerville. Jimmy Somerville. Jimmy Somerville. Jimmy Somerville, yeah, not yeah, Summerfield. Yeah, yeah. Paddy Summerfield, yeah. great documentary photographer. Um, black and white work, um, huge... Um, back catalogue of, of black and white, white work but one of his stories was was beautiful um and i'm just i don't know why i'm thinking but but uh, darcy's stories reminded me slightly of this um where he photographed his mother and father in the last few years of their their life it's just i think the project's just simply called mother and father but the the mm. really clever bit about the uh, the project was that he photographed them all from behind you you rarely ever see a photograph in front of them looking back it's always from behind and one of that reasons is that um, you're always you're always following their right, so that you're always looking into the photograph to see what they're looking at. So he felt that their journey, their photographic, uh, his his sort of photographic journey of their of their journey, was that you you travelled with them because you were always looking at what they were looking at. And I thought that was a really interesting way to to do a a, a project. I, I don't know why Darcy reminds me so much of that, but but perhaps because of the end of the story, I don't know. But uh, worth, looking, worth looking up Paddy Summerfield yeah. for that. Right, back to Facebook. Look, right, this is from Luke Warwick, and he says, question, request. Uh, he says it's more for Neil. I'm trying to do more video work using both the X-H1 and the T3, depending on what mood I'm in. Me too. I'd love you, I'd love you to do a show more on the topic for a change and wondered if you had any planned... Um, so, so it's more of a request, really. I don't understand. More, more on what, what? More on this show? I guess so. Yeah, more on video. It would appear lots more of us are now flicking the switch to movie oh, mode, and so no, I'm sure it would be a well received episode. I thought, I thought you meant like a behind the scenes for the Fuji cast, mm. which would be difficult because you're you're 158 thousand miles away, aren't you, in Bunker yeah. Malmesbury? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> before yeah. we before we went into lockdown, by the way, I had I'd set all these um, pods up. So we just had to clip in a, an X H one or whatever, and so they they they're all sort of preset. Even on the actual tripod bits, it says what the what the aperture should be and 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 what the what the ISO was, etc. So that we could just do all these lovely behind the scenes um, films of us, Kev. We got to make one, and we got locked down, <laughs> and then we never made another one. Yeah, um, I mean, Luke, Luke, Luke makes a good point. Actually, there are a lot more people. You and I um, both. You know, we spend more time with our cameras in video mode during lockdown than we have in oh, stills mode. Definitely. Um, so yeah, maybe we should try and um, try and get some guests on that are more video orientated. Perhaps, perhaps that will quench Luke's thirst. Yeah. Anything in s- specifically that you'd like to know? Do write in, and and from our own experience, I mean, you make you make a lot more YouTube than I do. Um, so your your work now is very much focused on talking to camera as well isn't it? i mean i know you do some documentaries but there's a, a lot of talking to camera stuff and i think um without sort of blowing smoke up the proverbial um i i think that you've um i can honestly see a real difference in the way that you present to camera kev you 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 look really so so much more relaxed and it's it's i know we're yet to see the the outtakes by the way as you said but <laughs> but but you feel to me that you feel that you're really comfortable now talking to camera. Yeah, it, it, it looks perfect for you. I don't know how you you personally feel and, and how long that's taken to get to feel that way. Well, yesterday, for example, the, the clip that I put on yesterday only had about two minutes of a preamble and then it went straight into the, to the, to the film. And uh, I... 
<laughs> when I was editing it, I realized twice I did this. I filmed it. I thought oh, I did that in one take. Great. And went back to the, took it to the computer and realized I was staring at my um, external monitor rather than at the lens. <laughs> yeah. So it looked like I was looking at somebody off camera. Yeah. I did that twice. Oh, right. Twice. So I'm constantly looking at that to make sure that the framing is right and, you know, bit of my, my eyebrows aren't pointing up too high and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> when I finally just, in the end, I just go, oh, and I just sit there, stare at the camera, and just blather. Yeah. It, well, know, if you, you are, know. if you are taught, there was a. Uh, it doesn't work, work, work at all with um, with auto cue because you can't you can't put it on the front of the the, the glass that's pointed at, that's angled at forty five degrees. But if you're just speaking straight into a lens, for anybody mm. making vlogs, etc., really simple tip that was um, that I came across years ago when I did some pieces to camera when when I was working in the Beeb was if you were out in the field, what the uh, what the camera op would do would put uh, a sticker around on the top of the lens, Did you know, around the lens with, with the housing. Mm -hmm. It used to put a, a, re a fluorescent sticker, which just, whoa, it just sort of sang at you. So you could never take your eyes off that strip, and that was close enough for your eye line to be looking straight into the camera. And I thought that was a really, really good, really very simple tip to remind you to look straight down the, the barrel of the lens. But, but auto cue, you're also very comfortable, I think, with auto cue now, aren't you? I think I'm not know. using auto cue. Well, I, 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 oh, I got really? oh. so angry with those things. Did so you? I had one that did go in the lens. So you, you put it on your iPhone or whatever the phone you've got. The parrot one. Parrot thing, yeah. yeah. And and the principle was good. You'd, you'd, you'd screw a filter onto the lens. Um, it had this little kind of concave, not concave, but yeah. um, 45 degree reflector. So the words would come up in the lens and you would read it. Um, but the amount of times my phone fell off that thing, um, uh, ooh, I was getting very angry with it. So yeah, I don't do I don't do that now. I just I just talk. I must try and find it. But there's a very very funny blooper reel on YouTube that features people where auto cue has gone wrong. I remember it myself actually. Granada. <laughs> I used to do the um, the uh, the weekends. Do the um, do the continuity. When do you remember when continuity announcers was, were in vision? You know, like, yeah. tonight yeah. in Anglia, um, but they're not in vision anymore, are they? But um, but when they used to be in vision. Do you remember the war, Grandad? In vision. At uh, Granada, I had the weekend shift, and it was um, either Saturday or Sunday, mo most often Sunday. <laughs> Nobody wanted to work Sunday, so I'd, I'd sh schlep up to Manchester from Berkshire, and I, I'd, do the, um, I'd do the Granada at the uh, continuity at the weekend. And uh, they used to use, um, you know, uh, you can have little floor pedals. To make, yeah. to make it go forward or backward. And you, it took a little while to get used to. Do it with your foot now. If you're moving your foot, so that if you, you, press, you press it down and the script would roll down, you think, oh, that's nice. But um, I, I remember one day reading, I mean, you only have one job. You sit there for hours watching a, watching a Western or something, then have to pop up after about uh, an hour and a half and just do the introduction between that and Coronation Street Omnibus or whatever it was that we used to do. And I remember I got so excited after waiting a, a, a minute and a half for my very first continuity announcement on Granada that I pressed down on the foot pedal and, it, and was, the whole script, the minute and a half script went <laughs> and I was left with a black screen in front of me thinking, fuck, this is live. <laughs> <laughs> in the days when we didn't have that many more channels and I, I was acutely aware there'd be a good couple of million people watching <laughs> thank god i had the uh the the presence of mind to put the script in front of me which is something they said don't ever have the script in front of you on the desk it looks messy and i didn't i didn't listen to them and thank god i didn't <laughs> i guess otherwise i mean all you got was the top of my head when it was slightly less bald in those days but, but but at least I managed to save the day and get through to Coronation Street. You always see them on the news and stuff, don't you? They, they're clearly walk, uh, looking at auto prompts, and then at the end they pick up their pieces of paper and shuffle them. Yeah, well, <laughs> they, they've obviously got the script there as a backup as well. But it's that, that little yeah. kind of yeah. shuffling yeah. seems to be some kind of symbol. Yeah. Oh, there's a very funny one of a guy going absolutely mad. I can't read this throwing stuff around the studio i must try and find that video it's very very funny but general video tips though kev when you're when you're recording your stuff i know it's gfx but let, let's you know let's try and apply some xt3 rules to this because not 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 a lot of people have a gfx what what do you set it up when you're doing pieces to camera what's your well, right, no what, difference what, what's between your the cameras yeah oh, i suppose yeah. no there isn't is there no. there's no difference really it's just the sensor size so true, 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 i'm true. typically shooting um at 25 frames per second, mm -hmm. um, 50, uh, 50 shutter speed of 50, whatever they call it, 150th. Um, I use my Aperture 120D light 
which is um, sun balanced or daylight balanced. So I set my white balance to daylight. I set my ISO to 200 because that's the minimum you can do it in filming. Um, although on the X-T3, I think you can go down to 160. You can. And uh, if I'm shooting in F-Log, which is the raw movie format, then the ISO, the lowest ISO is 800. So I have to adjust the, the light accordingly. I use the little remote control in my hand to control the light. So I have my, I have the little external monitor, which gives me a preview of, of what it's going to be. So I use that to, to judge my exposure and just adjust the light rather than anything else. Yeah. That's it. And then uh, just before I press play, I go across to the bathroom and uh, tweak my eyebrows and, you know, <laughs> just kind of straighten things up a little bit, put a little bit of makeup on. A bit of slap. Yeah, a bit of slap. Brush my hair. Although now I'm wearing a hat because I've got lockdown head. <laughs> oh, is that why you're wearing a hat in that video? Yeah, I look like a blinking... I, I, I look, look like something has been dragged out oh, of the no, North Pole. Kev, no, no, no. I thought you, look, I thought you looked YouTube cool. But there's some, yeah. there's some quite good tips. And, and uh, oh, lens what, what are... Give me a couple of different lenses that you would usually use if you were filming. I mean, I, I know well, that the 1855 to me is a staple for filming on the X8, right. uh, on the XH1. That is yes. So I like I like the cinematic look. So I quite like the depth of field, and I, I've I've done a little bit of work with the background. So the well, I should say Gemma's done a little bit of work with my little studio background. Yeah. So the background of that video that you see with the bookshelf and all that kind of stuff yeah. is just in the corner, painted onto the wall. Well, the, the stuff's there, but the wall's painted. And the rest of the studio looks nothing like that so i i do like that cinematic look and on the on the gfx you have to be very careful which lenses you use you need a lens if you want to do face tracking you need a lens that has um the linear motor so it has to be an lm lens right. uh, which tend to be more expensive so i've got the 50 mil the one that's on there now the one that was updated yesterday is, is shot on the 50 mil which is 3.5 aperture, maximum aperture 3.5. So it yeah. doesn't have the, the narrowest depth of field or widest depth of field, I don't know which, which way it works. Uh, however, because it's a GFX, medium format sensor, it, you know, it is deeper. Uh, when I'm shooting on the XT range, I usually use something like the um, 23 1.4 or the 35 1.4 if i ever knew where that was um <laughs> and uh yeah so i like the depth fields but but you need to have lenses that will keep up with the face recognition yeah. tracking yeah that's really important if you're going to be shooting at narrow depth of field a lot of people actually choose to film uh in i, I know it's not so easy if you're filming yourself for youtube but um when I'm filming out in the field, I tend I tend to manually focus. I quite like I go. It can't be shallow. I appreciate that, but mm. I tend to put on the focus uh, peaking, and uh, which is very good in the XT3 and the XH1. Nice bright red focus peaking. Very very easy to use. Usually about f f five six or something like that, and uh, I, I prefer to manually focus when I'm out there in the field. I've got mm. I've got quite reasonably quick i think of doing it as well but when i'm doing my kind of um the review stuff and i'm swiping past products and various things like that yeah i'm manually focusing that as well it's it's the, the autofocus con the, the face recognition is really only for the, for the face to camera stuff and then you know you're still going to be more likely to not have um blurry blurry patches yeah. if you're if you're manually focused and using a deeper depth of field yeah. um you know but then of course if you sit back or go forward or whatever um, but you often see, I mean, even if you look at, um, y you know, some of the big wigs on YouTube, um, you will often see that they, their focus breathes in and out occasionally, where the, the camera that they're using is, is, you know, having a little little problem doing the face recognition at that moment in time, usually flips straight back, but yeah. you can see it quite often. Yeah. Um, I, I was talking to a, a DOP the other day who, who has produ uh, who's worked on things like um, Westworld. And uh, he was talking about that. He said, let, let the film breathe a bit. I, who cares if it goes in and out of focus a bit? And also we were talking about this, um, this return to the, the very shaky kind of footage. I mean, it was, it was The Shining that, that introduced um, the concept of using um, uh, Steadicam. And, that, mm. and I think it was, it was built in a, a very basic way, a method out of bed springs or something like that. It was an extraordinary story about how the first um, use of, uh, of, of Steadicam. And then I think every everything became very steady, didn't it? And even recently, with with gimbals getting better and sm smaller and better, but now there seems to be a return, um, certainly in in action scenes, of very shaky uh, movement. I mean, you don't want to have too much shake. You want to try and return sometimes to a locked off camera, so there's a bit of stability in your life. But a lot more stuff now is being done without a steady cam. And of course, if if you've got the advantage like the XT4 and the XH1 have uh, of of having IBIS. 
then um, then I would argue whether you really need, unless you're running with it, in which case having a platform to hold on to is quite handy. But I would argue whether you really need to use as much gimbal stuff as, as people use. I yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I've been watching Hinterland again recently, which is a great programme, kind of crime document, not documentary, crime drama based in Aberystwyth. And that's, there's a lot of kind of, I suppose they're trying to film it as if you were observing it from within the room. Yes, yes. So that's, yeah, that's, that's what yeah. they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Right, let's talk to our guest. This week, uh, we're going to talk to Adam Karnach from First Man Photography, who is a landscape... Well, he's, I'd say, yes, predominantly landscape. Although he does get involved in talking about, um, particularly during this time, how, how he's felt um, about lockdown and being a filmmaker and being a photographer in, in, this, particular, in this particular period of our, our history and lives. This is Adam Karnach. I've been starting so many of these chats, Adam, with, with the words, how has this time been for you in reference to that virus, which I'm now beginning to feel has taken on its own kind of Voldemort nature of not wanting to even say its name. So let me change this slightly. As a, as a landscape photographer, I'm going to say a mountain dweller in some respects, has this been the perfect escape kind of occupation? I mean, it's been, it's been a difficult time, hasn't it, for everybody? I was talking to my wife about it the other day and we were sort of saying that everybody's experience of the lockdown has been something very different so in all honesty photography hasn't been the primary thing for me um, whereas it's normally or often is an escape lockdown has been completely dominated for me and continues to be to some extent by being a father and having two school-aged children at home um, and that's completely dominated it and made it particularly difficult. But I was very keen to continue driving forwards uh, because it's always been something I've done when times, have, when times get tough. Uh, I think you can, either, you can either kind of feel sorry for yourself and look back at what you had before or just keep driving forward. And that's what I've always done. And I tried to do that with during lockdown as well. And it was at that point that I've decided to, uh, coupled with just being having kids around the whole time and it being impossible to make videos at home i took some studio space which is where i'm sat now and that's been a a positive move during lockdown to keep driving things forward obviously a landscape photographer doesn't necessarily need a studio but um, there were a number of reasons why i made that change partly because working at home really doesn't suit me I know a lot of people have enjoyed that, haven't they, over lockdown? But um, I, I was working at home for pretty much two years straight prior to lockdown, and it becomes a lonely pursuit, as, as being a landscape photographer is anyway. Uh, and whilst landscape photographers do search out solitude, I guess that's part of the reason why we do it. Uh, there's a lot of landscape photographers who are introverted, I suppose. Someone, someone accused me or suggested recently on one of my videos that I was an omnivert and, it, and it's, a, it's basically a mixture of being an introvert and an extrovert uh, you have traits of both things to be fair it, I think it does possibly fit I, I, I always thought I was introverted to some extent but then my actions might suggest otherwise when I'm talking to people all the time and my previous job of being a police officer was obviously front and centre of being in front of people so well i was going to say that i mean you were you were a police officer for 14 years so that that's hard, that's hardly introverted what 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 kind of skills that you perhaps learned as a police officer uh, have been applicable if, if if any to your photographic work i think it's it's absolutely the the key and the basis of the the type of photographer i have become because i think photography we in, in photography the very nature of it we are capturing moments of life life is the very essence of photography and and vice versa so being a police officer you or i saw the very best of people and then often saw the very worst of people and also saw people on a daily basis experiencing the worst moment of their life and that that can be anything from you turn up to deal with someone who's just had their house burgled. Now, that's an everyday occurrence for a police officer, but it's not an everyday occurrence getting your house burgled, and it's actually really not a very nice day when that happens to you. So it was kind of seeing people in these vulnerable states 
as it were. But then, and then, but then it went all the way to sort of dealing with child murders and things like that and being first on scene at these horrific scenes that's kind of formed or helped allowed me I suppose whilst trying to deal with all that forming this philosophy about life that I now try to feed in to my photography and it, it's been it's been a nice it's, it's a nice outlet because cops are tough you've got to be so uh, there was one one very serious incident i dealt with with a, where a child had been killed by her mother that i, I was I, that i was first on scene with i've been writing about it in the book that i'm going to be really releasing soon uh, which is why it's sort of at the forefront of my mind but after dealing with that there were some things in place to check that you were okay and all this kind of thing you they offered to you to see a counselor and we had to go and see senior managers and stuff to talk about it and I was always very tough about it. I was just like, yeah, of course, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. It is. And I I remember saying to the chief inspector I was speaking to, I said, look, like that didn't bother me yesterday. But what has bothered me is I've got a thousand pound bill to fix my car this morning. I said that that bothered me. And, And at the time that was true. But then as the years go by, and especially now I've left the police, you start to reflect on all of these things. And it's it has a lasting effect on you, and there's there's a very there's an element of darkness that I've seen that can't help but change you. And then I, I quite like the fact that whilst dealing with all this all these dark things that life has to offer, out of that comes the light. And photography is what that's all about for me. So YouTube, you've burst through the 100k mark. So you have that. Do you have that shiny YouTube frame to celebrate it by now, Adam? I do. I do. Yes. And I, I, I when when I when I received it, it was a little while after I'd gone past the mark. But I was really determined to do something to celebrate it because I'm not particularly good at celebrating my own success and any trophy I've ever won or earned or anything like that I just I stick it straight in a drawer and try and forget about it I I want to keep like I said I want to keep moving forward I don't want to be looking back at my successes uh, that any much more than I do my failures but when I did that I thought right I'm gonna I am gonna do something because it's been a lot of hard work to get to that point so I, I hiked it up a mountain basically I thought that was quite fitting for what what I, what I did to get to that hundred thousand, uh, my mate, my mate came with me, my my best mate, who was subscriber number one. So I hiked it up to the top of a mountain, stuck it on top of this crag, and took a photo of it. And then since then, I've stuck it in a drawer and don't don't look at it again. But I do have, but I do then have that that photo of it. Uh, so I, I need to get that. I need to print that out at some point, and I'll stick that on my wall rather than the rather than the plaque itself. Is that really true, though? You 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 knew your subscriber number one. Yes, yeah, yeah it was it was him. Yeah. And why did you start the channel though? What what was the what was the purpose be- behind it? Yeah, I mean, we talked about being an introvert or an extrovert, and I always thought I, w- I was the sort of person who didn't particularly like attention, and I still feel like that to some extent. But as the years have gone by, talking about being self-aware and questioning yourself, my actions seem to suggest otherwise. Uh, and I've become, I've got to the stage now where I enjoy talking to people about photography, whether it's on camera or on a podcast like this. Uh, and it, it, it's definitely made my photography better. But I started the channel partly because I wanted to share some of the knowledge that I'd developed over the years, but I, I, it wasn't selfless. I wanted to promote myself. I wanted to grow uh, my audience for my photography. That was initially why I did it. I wanted to get more jobs, basically, and, and push myself as a photographer. And then as it developed into doing the landscape vlogs, it's become so ingrained now with my photography that I find it difficult now to separate it because if I go out to take a landscape photograph, I might as well film it. And and doing the vlogs has driven me to get out to do landscape photography more often than I probably otherwise would have done because I've got a weekly schedule on YouTube. And it's just, I mean, it was was strange because I I filmed a couple of test runs of videos. So I got the... and I was always fairly comfortable with the camera, so I got that up. I knew I needed video lighting, so I bought some video lighting. I set the camera up. I thought about the the composition of the shots. I thought about the tutorial I was going to deliver, and then on that very first time, I clicked record 
on that camera and I'm staring down this lens and I thought, ah, oh, uh, what do I do? I've got to actually say something now. And it's got to be coherent and concise and something that people are actually going to watch. So yeah, as, as, the, as the years went by and I started putting the videos out, people started to watch and come back and make comments saying that they enjoyed the videos. Uh, and it just grew from there. And I remember getting my first 100 subscribers and that was a, a huge, huge moment. When you think about, like, if you think about 100 people in a room, that's a lot of people. That's a very good point, actually, because I think people sometimes get lost in this, well, I've, I've got to get this many subs or this many views, when mm -hmm. in actual fact, if you looked out at an audience of three, 100 or 300 or 600, which for many YouTubers would look at that as kind of, oh, I've only got 600 views, 600 people in a room watching you would be a frightening experience, I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's just, uh, I've been struggling with it recently, in, in all honesty, because the pandemic probably hasn't helped. I didn't put out as many videos and I actually enjoyed the break because as the channel grows and you're very aware that people are watching because they tell you and there's a certain amount of jealousy that goes along with that. So you, t you, st you start to suffer these uh, people talking about you behind your back and saying not very nice things. And it's, it's a real strain on your mental health sometimes because it also it's also a very a very lonely existence because friends and family don't understand the things you're going through and the only re I mean you need to find peers and that and really that's other YouTubers it's this it's a very strange existence where you, you're this one man production team publishing it as well and then you get the comments back and sometimes that's difficult and I've been I've been re making it I let it get to me sometimes and I don't know why I've been talking to my wife about this recently because when people make a little comment that is maybe a bit mean or a bit troll like I really take it to heart and I don't understand why because in real life if someone does that I couldn't care less. Like I really don't. I really don't, in real life. I really don't care what people think. And of course, with your police background as well, you'd have thought, well, a Adam of all people is going to have this proper thick skin. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in real life I do because I, 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 I believe I'm a, a pretty nice guy. So I, when when you see that in real life, you kind of think, well, you're wrong. You just that's unfair. Like you're shouting at me, and there's no reason for it. But on online, when it's in in, in black and white in written form it feels like it takes on this other power because it's it's there as a record then but also you don't know who you're talking you don't know who it is talking to you or trying to engage you and a lot of the time it's just some bitter grumpy people behind a keyboard who really who really just need our pity rather than rather than anything else. Uh, I think Sean Tucker, um, the YouTuber, summed that up very well when he said, you know, you'll never find a talented troll. That's very true. That is very true. And it's nice sometimes because people jump to your, like other viewers will jump to my, uh, or they'll have my back, as it were, which is quite nice. But over the last few months, particularly, I think I've got much better at almost trying to disassociate from that. You seem to have started doing more videos about the connection between life and photography, and, and as you call it, and step back from the, the slog of tutorial after tutorial, which is which is the sort of understood A to Z way of building an audience quickly. But the, the channel's been subtly changing, hasn't it, really? As time has gone on, I wanted to do less educational stuff, direct educational stuff on YouTube, because A, I don't think that benefits a channel anymore. If you just do some random, excellent tutorial, a lot of people might see it through search and things, but then it won't necessarily mean that they become a long-term viewer and someone that you can connect with. And that I'm looking to grow an audience that is good quality. And it's people that believe in what I'm doing and they trying to find a core audience rather than a broad one that don't really care. And I think transitioning some way away from doing tutorials on there was something I needed to do for me because there's also, there's only so many times you can teach a particular thing. So I, I needed to find something more sustainable so I've done a few videos about, the, a few more philosophical videos, if you like, that talk about this connection between life and photography. And then I do do the vlogs, which kind of show an adventure story, basically, of trying to find 
this shot and one of the videos I did recently I was hunting for this quite special tree in North Yorkshire and it it was essentially a quest story like uh, and it and it did end up following that arc and that's I want to be producing entertainment inspiring content around photography rather than just the transactional information and tutorial type stuff. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that moments like that come across completely genuinely and authentically for you, Adam. And I, I thought it'd be good to take a listen to the the absolute joy you demonstrate about your photography at moments like the one you describe. This is it. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm so excited right now because it's all paid off. All that hard work, all that effort to get here has paid off and the weather couldn't be much better for this particular shot. I've got that golden hour light. And then behind this fantastic, this fantastically beautiful tree, the weather is a little bit worse. But what that's doing is it's acting as an addition to the image really because the tree now has some separation because of that hill fog. The mountain in the distance is under that cloud and there's mist and mood behind it, but it's still gonna be a beautiful, warm image. Starting a channel for many is the hardest bit, uh, as is the consistency. From my own viewpoint, I mean, I, I have a I have a fledgling channel, Adam, which I'm almost embarrassed to mention to you of seven okay. of seven thousand, which is tiny. And and Kev's now um, uh, he's at the he's just got to the thirty four thousand mark, which is tremendous. But I find starting a film so very hard. That that that's the biggest battle, isn't it? The consistency. I mean, you say you've you've built yourself. Um, uh, well, there's a kind of a model, if you like, in place where you say, right, Tuesday is that, Wednesday is that, Friday is yeah. release day. You know, you've you found yourself a pattern of of uh, of, of operation, haven't you? I think it probably. <laughs> I hate to. I hate to think that I make it look easier than it is because I'm quite glad. I'm quite glad we're na- we're talking now on on a Wednesday morning because it's distracting me from having to think of what I'm going to talk about on a YouTube video or plan or planning a video because it, it's not always that much fun. You kind of it's this creative anxiety we get thinking well if I do that will it be good enough and and I've got to the point now where I have I feel this responsibility to create good content with my photography particularly my landscape photography when I don't have a client I'm creating that work for me so it's not I don't really think about what other people are going to think of it although that does I think when people say I'm creating this photograph just for myself I don't always think they're being totally honest with themselves because it's natural for us to like or for us to want people to like the things that we are creating whether it's a photograph or a song or uh, a, di- a, a, a food dish we want people to actually like it but with with that work i'm not as bothered about what people think about it but with a youtube video i want people to like it that's the whole point of me of me creating that content so and and, and that that constant pressure to create is part of what makes it stressful and difficult. And but you're you're a very natural communicator. When I when I watch one of your films, he does it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like you're scripting it. It feels like it naturally flows, and that goes back to what you were just saying. You wouldn't want to make it look too easy because I'm sure it isn't quite as easy as that. Yeah. So the, it depends on the type of video I do. Some of the more philosophical ones where the, essentially just pieces to camera, they they will have a plot outline, not script as such, but there'll be a very a relatively stringent outline of what I want to talk about because my mind generally wanders in lots of different directions, so I'm not quite as concise as it might seem on those videos. But then again, the vlogs are totally unscripted, so all the things I'm saying on those vlogs are as it happened and uh, as i'm out in the landscape talking about the landscape or talking about an amazing moment with the light they're all real moments that i do i I generally do it in one take if i so there'll be an odd occasion where i'll do a second take and i'll always end up just using the first take because it's usually more genuine and better and even even if i've stumbled over a word it the feel of it still is better than the second take which is word perfect but it doesn't quite have the feeling and i think that's the key to those vlogs is that it's like people say it to me all the time that we, i feel like i'm there with you and that, that's a really nice really nice comment to get i'm intrigued adam who uh youtuber watches what which youtube channels do do you follow 
I mean, photography wise, I did used to watch Jared Polan. I thought some of the some of the stuff he did was great. I really enjoyed his podcast, the the, the Raw Talk podcast, when he did that. I, it's a shame he stopped that, but he, I mean, he obviously rubs a lot of people up the wrong way. But I, I think he he was ahead. He was ahead of the curve, and I respect what what he what he's done. And then other photography people, I keep an eye on what Peter McKinnon's doing. I like the kind of I mean, the trajectory he took to going right to the top was very interesting to witness. But in terms of photographers, I don't really watch that many. There have been a few because I try and take inspiration from other art forms. So there's a couple of like guitar tutorial guys that I watch that that make it more entertaining and inspiring than just about the learning. And then I'm, I'm more into... I watch a lot of tech stuff just for that little bit of escapism and see what like the new new gear is that's going on so I keep in touch but I try not to watch too much because sometimes it influences me negatively to then go out and create what I want to create and talk about what I want to talk about. Our thanks to Adam Carnach from First Man Photography. We'll have links to Adam's channel and uh, site on the show page at fujicast.co.uk. And if you, um, after this show, want to hear more inspirational people talking, then take a jaunt across to my other podcast, Photography Daily, where Monday, today, we're talking again to the, well, it's another YouTuber, actually, Sean Tucker, but for a very different reason. I had a text sent to me last week that started with the words, I've failed. It was from a friend in the photography business, and it started a discussion in my mind about the mental health toll this pandemic is taking both in our businesses and photographic lives and personally. So I I called up a friend of mine from the YouTube sphere uh, whose philosophical outlook on life and photography I thought was perfectly placed to deal with how photographers are feeling when everyone around seems to be so sorted when that's not how you may personally be experiencing this. I think you have to be aware of the marketing. Like everyone's always marketing, so especially online. So you're not hearing from people who are struggling because they don't want to admit it. The fact that your friend reached out to you to say, hey, I'm struggling is unfortunately too rare. And no one ever or very rarely jumps on social media to tell the general public that they're struggling. If like me, you're a fan of chicken soup for the soul, I'm hoping that's what today's show may feel. Then on Wednesday, I talk with... Nancy Floyd, who four decades ago set out to make a photographic project about the ageing process, which is nothing short of fascinating. A portrait a day at 9am in a project called Weathering Time. In my 50s and 60s, things would really start to accelerate, and they have, um, and they continue to do so. So really, I'm only now beginning to, to uh, what I think really change physically in my pictures. But I think that I'm much more comfortable in my skin because I've seen myself age over time. Nancy Floyd, Photography Daily is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Right, back to your questions. Kev, one from the Facebook group. Well, I'm going to do two. First one is a a quick fire one from uh, Chuck Nick Norris. He says, what's your favourite wardrobe? Where do you go and get your clothes from? Favourite wardrobe? Yeah. The one upstairs, I I, I bought it from Ikea. It's lovely. It just opens up really nicely. The (laughs) screws work really well. I put it together in about half an hour flat. Is that what you mean? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I did a massive uh, H&M had a massive online um, New Year's Day New Year's Eve sale New right. Year's thing whatever it is and I uh, I got all my my new clothes from there did very you? excited one of them looked like they're from 1970s the old stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right that's where that that's where that jumper came I know I like from. that jumper is that from H&M like yeah. it hashtag yeah, yeah, yeah. me like Kev I'm ordering one now it was great <laughs> uh, really really cheap as well uh, that's why it's falling apart in the washing machine anyway so Neil Lever <laughs> then goes on to say um, by the way we did this is I'm not on Neil's question yet we did have a, a comment about the word jumper did All you right. read that no there was a comment that came in yesterday I think it was and it was uh, something like I can't remember whether it was a comment on the website or on Facebook or whatnot but it was uh, why do you keep saying the word jumper <laughs> well that's what we call them in this country yeah but whichever country he's it's from jumper that's a, woman's oh. garment woman's oh. garment is it okay and the, and the word graft as well he was confused with oh, so right. graft graft means something very different to where he's from as well as in working hard yeah but they're, they're, see in australia as well you can't say things like um rooting around um i i rooted this it means something very different doesn't it have you have, have you done any rooting today but jumper i thought jumper was pretty international kev oh, well in, in australia of course a jumper is a is a is that's what they call their rugby jerseys is it yeah, 
put your jumper oh. on. Oh, go, go and have a route through your jumper drawer. Number eight, get your jumper oh, on. It's so difficult You're trying to remember what. I mean, it's difficult enough with Nikon, Nikon, Nikon. <laughs> anyway, Neil goes on to say Neil Lever says, Gents, are either you still members of any of the professional photography organizations? Dun, dun, dun. No, move on. no, move How on do you to view the, next? the support, <laughs> guidance, and representation they have given the members during this most needed of times? Uh, no. Thank you very um, much. Well, I, well I, I wouldn't. Um, it's a good question, actually, but I wouldn't know the answer to what they're doing because I don't belong to any now. I left them a long time ago. Is three years a long time? <laughs> Maybe. I am. I'm a. I'm a member of the guild. Um, I'm not a paying member. I'm a member because I did some. Um, um, what do they call it? Webinars. Which one? Webinars. Pl- plumbers or, or the guild of carpentry? The guild. The guild of <laughs> the guild of grumpiness. Uh, <laughs> the guild of photographers. And actually, yeah. because I'm a member, I have seen the behind the scenes stuff that they've been doing, and they they have been very proactive. Now, I'm not so sure about. I know that there was this big thing between all of the. Uh, bodies where they tried to lobby the government. They all got together and tried to lobby the government. They created a Facebook page yeah. that just got cluttered with photographers being at, being typical photographers. Well, my business isn't struggling. No, oh, this is the busiest year of my life. What you should do, because you're so young, you don't understand what it was like when we shot film, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, so I left at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they, the Guild have done certainly done lots of free online uh, web bananas and all of that stuff. They've been doing a lot of free training for people and stuff. Um, but yes, that's that's really the only interaction I have with them these days. So I cannot comment on any of the others. To be totally honest with you, it's not like any of them are, you know, in the public eye. Can't see, you know, you don't see see them on BBC News like Chamber of Commerce or something. So you know, we need more money for other people. Yeah. Um, so. But I mean, the, the, the great thing about these uh, these societies and associations, etc., is that there is a deep sense of belonging for some people, and I think that's still important. And though I may be slightly flippant in what I felt it was doing for me, um, that's just a purely personal thing. I, I think the idea of belonging to some of these things is a, cra- a cracking idea, a great idea, because that sense of belonging, being a, being able to talk to each other in forums and debate stuff, that's got to be good. Oh yeah, they're all they're all they're all good in their own way. You know, ultimately, I think what we need. Is as a as a industry is a, a not for profit body, um, a proper one that is uh, you know is there for the good of the members, uh, a cooperative if you like. Mm. Uh, as far as I can tell, all of these ones, and I'm not including things like the RPS and stuff like this, but you know the the general ones that your average wedding photographer will join are are profit making yeah. concerns, and that's fine. Everybody needs to make some money. Um, but that presents itself with, uh, you know, a, a kind of devolution of interests, if you like, I think, anyway. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there you are. That's that's where we're at. I'm not a member of any of them apart from the Guild, um, like I say, by, by invite only. And uh, I can't really see what, what any of the others are doing in this time. I didn't realise that was by invite only. No, no, it's not by invite only. Sorry. I was invited because I did some web bananas for them. Ah, oh, right. Okay. I didn't pay to join. Ah, okay. Get that yeah. now. Um, here's one from this is just the best email address ever. Jay Griffer. Obviously, his name is Jay. Um, Jay Griffer. I'm a Jay. What do you do for a living? I'm a Jay Griffer. Do you like that? Wow. Jay Griffer. <laughs> Jay Griffer. <laughs> I don't know what Jay Griffer's. Jay Griffer TH. So I, I don't know what his surname is. Try that with your name. Neil Griffer. <laughs> it's a, but I, I'm, I've always thought Neil's a bit like yogurt. It's a, a very funny kind of word, isn't it? Yogurt. It never Try being called Kevin all your life. Neil, Kevin, Kevin, Neil. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about this so many times. It would be so nice to have a much more uh, sort of a, a flamboyant name. Not well, no, Neil, Neil Lever, who just a- we just answered his last question, oh, is going to be very upset. Sorry, with you. Neil. Yeah, but no, Neil Lever <laughs> sounds great together. <laughs> <laughs> Am I digging myself out of a hole? I just realised that. just get that, that shovel for you. I can't even edit that bit out because that would be, <laughs> won't work. Neil, take my humble apologies. It's just how I feel about my name, not your name. And I'm sure there are plenty of other Kevins listening that, that actually appreciate their name more than Kevin Mullins does. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Jay Griffer says, Hello, I'd like to hear your take on this idea of picking up the X100V, or it could be an older X100 model as well, and use the uh, the other two adapters as wider and tele lens instead of picking up a... We've had a very similar question to this recently, uh, an XE, uh, XE3 and buying three separate F2 lenses for street photography. I do wonder how often you or people you may know use the ND filter or, and flash on the X100. Thanks for the advice. Sincerely, Jay Griffer. 
or Jay, what would you do? What was your answer to that last time? I think we had a very similar question. Don't think you'd you'd well, use, you'd, you'd not use an XC three though, had you? I think that was the answer. There's three questions there, isn't there? Really, yeah. uh, is the uh, is 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 using the teleconverter and the wide angle converter on the X one hundred the equivalent of using an XC three with the twenty three thirty five fifty mil f two primes? With those f twos, yeah, that's yeah, ultimately. Yeah. Um, and yes, no, um, I would say the lens in the X100, you're always going to be, because it, it's a, a particular design uh, and it's recessed into the camera body a little bit. So it's it's not as fast, even on the X100V, as, as those F2 prime lenses, yeah. uh, the lens itself. So there's an element of that. And of course, when you do stick the um, teleconverter and the wide angle converter onto the X100, become, they become very odd shapes. Um, the teleconverter is, or is it the wide angle? Can't remember now. One of them is much bigger than the other one. Mm. Um, I've never used very, them. I never ever used them actually with with any of weird X100s. looking things. No. They are good. I shot lots of weddings on the X one hundred S with the uh, wide angle converter on it, so it does work for sure. X E three. Oh, oh, and the flash, the flash and the ND filter. Now that's interesting because somebody put some question, uh, some pictures up on the uh, Facebook group the other day, taken with the on camera flash on the X one hundred F, I think it was. And yeah, loads of people said, "Oh, I just never use that." And and actually, I use it uh, infrequently, but I do use it, and it is brilliant. I I love using it. Well, do you remember when we used to be able to go on holidays and stuff to you, Spain? You used it in Spain. I love using right? it on the beach. Yeah, you did. Yeah, and you used it. A really good effect as well, didn't you? You managed to darken down the 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 everything behind. It was was really good. Yeah, like, it's yeah. it's a it's a neat little flash built yeah, into those X one hundred. And people do not use it very much, but they, you know, and that's fine. I mean, a lot of people who buy that camera are typically going to be, you know, your your kind of uh, documentary photographers who only use natural light. You know, a bit like me. Um, but you can throw that flash on it and make a bit of creativity out of it. It's it's good. It's flash? good fun. What's flash? A ND filter. Yeah. Uh, well, the ND filter in the XT in the X100V, of course, is now four stops compared to the three stops uh, available in the other cameras. The, the F, yeah. And I feel like with the ND filter, the ND filter was ridiculously useful until the electronic shutter came along. Because the moment the electronic shutter came along, you could, you know, you'd use the ND filter to block out light, of course, if you're trying to shoot wide open and, or well, not even wide open, but, you know, you've, you've got a bright exposure. But then the electronic shutter came along, which means you can shoot wide open up to one thirty-two thousandth of a second. So the ND filter, whilst it's, you know, you're, you're going to be able to use that on the mechanical shutter and filter out that light up to four stops. It did take a bit of a hit in terms of usage, I think, when the electronic shutter came into play. So, so a lot of people probably do not use it however they should because it is very capable very good wouldn't it be nice if you could use that in in um in filming mode as well that'd be cool can't oh, do yeah, that on the x100v yeah. well maybe that's the thing for the xh2 one day one day oh talking of which by the way uh, andreas is coming back on the show soon to answer your questions isn't he andreas he is indeed Ask yes andreas. um he, he will he will be on the first show of february uh, which i think is something like the first or second of february i guess yeah uh, yes, he will be here answer questions. There is a thread in the Facebook group called Ask Andreas. We do have quite a lot of questions on there. However, I have to say, a lot of the questions on there are technical type questions, which he is very capable of answering and will be able to answer. But maybe you've got more questions, more perhaps about marketing side of things, maybe how Fujifilm works, you know, what's their plans for the future, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I will, I will filter out the questions accordingly. But yes, he will, he will be on the show. And uh, a very good guy he is too. I sent in a question um, that uh, is about the XH2 because I know that he always gets very angry with me whenever I mention the XH. To, so I thought I'd better send it in as a pseudonym. See if you can see if you can spot it. Right. Um, <laughs> book time. Book time. Kevin's book of the week. Well, we, oh, this week it's Diane Arbus. Diane Arbus. Listen to this. Ready? Yep. Put my book on the table. <laughs> <laughs> what what's that supposed to mean uh yes diana arbus revelations now as i always do when i i pick my book of the week i go to amazon to see if it's widely available and, and you, you the you answer is no not available but if it is highly expensive <laughs> well it says on amazon hardcover available from 119 pounds 99 so you may find this on aid books uh you may find it on uh, the oxfam online you know, and, and, and you know what when the world gets better oh, i can't wait for that <laughs> i'm gonna go up to um hey on why and and 
steam through all of their bookshops because I, I collect loads of I've got loads of brilliant photo books from those places and some of them have been on the shelf since like 1958 and it's you know yeah. it's like five pence and yeah. you take them home you look on a book and it's like woo, 400 good books <laughs> diane arbus uh revelations so diane arbus uh we all mm, i you you know of diane mm, arbus of mm, course mm. most people know of diane arbus um no sadly she uh, she committed suicide mm, she was uh, uh, late 40s 48 and and this book actually came out and not long after her death, didn't it? Exactly, yeah. So this is a retrospective um, of her entire career. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is an absolutely beautifully bound book, beautifully printed. The, obviously, the, the pictures are, are lovely, but the actual thought into the layout and the font and everything is is really nice. The RRP on this book, by the way, is £70. So £119.99. Oh, so it's not that much. No, it's much. not, is it? No. So uh, I'll just read off one paragraph from the... Um, from the inner leaf and it says Diane Arbus uh, revelations affords the first opportunity to explore the origins scope and aspirations of what is a wholly original force in photography Arbus's frank treatment of her subjects and her faith in the intrinsic power of the medium have produced a body of work that is often shocking in its purity in its steadfast celebration of things as they are presented many of her lesser known or previously unpublished photographs in the context of the iconic images reveals a subtle yet persistent view of the world yeah. now that idea of the persistent view of the world I think is is very true there's a wonderful quote by joe mayowitz um and this was after she died and and he said if she was doing the kind of work she was doing and photography wasn't enough to keep her alive what hope did we have yeah. um and i think that that implies that um, so i suppose what joe's saying there is that it was such an ingrained part of her life documenting other people it was like breathing to her if breathing wasn't enough to keep her alive then then what hope did she have now the the book itself is uh it's chronological to a certain extent in terms of you know it's laid out in in part in a chronological order there's a whole section called a chronology but before that you get a whole load of full size uh images full page images that are you know beautiful so and it's so sim- some of the stuff is so simple Page 96, for example, girl in a coat lying on her bed. And again, we always go back to this idea of, uh, you know, the imperfections of, of pictures are what makes them unique and beautiful. There's a Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, here we go. Look, right. So page 93, a Christmas tree in a living, in a living room, Leventon. LI 1963. What state is LI? LI. 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 I don't what state know. would that be? Um, Louisiana? Mm, yeah, maybe. LI. I'll mm, look it up. Maybe. Um, anyway, there's a Christmas tree. So, Christmas time, everybody takes a picture of their Christmas tree, usually on their phone, sticks it on Instagram, and then they get a new phone and their Instagram account gets deleted and stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> this picture here is of a wonderful Christmas tree. Um, uh, Long Island. Very 1970s. Long Island, by the way. Long Island. Yeah. There we go. Not Louisiana. Long Idiot. Island. I knew that. Um, anyway, so this picture, Christmas tree, uh, sofa, Christmas tree, loads of presents under the tree as usual. There's a lamp, a standard lamp there, but it's still got the wrapping over the lamp because yeah. probably someone in this house smoked and so they didn't want the shades to, to discolour. You've got this massive square TV, you know, the kind of TV you'd see on Back to the Future in the first episode, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or the first part yeah. of it. We take these pictures, we look at these pictures. When we take them, we don't think anything of them. Nothing, right? It's just a snap of our living room. Now, uh, 1963, this was, what's that? 63, 73, 83, 93, 2003, 2013. To nearly 60 years ago, that picture has so much more power to it. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. So, more, so much more powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, of course, she had a lot of famous bodies of work. Um, but what I love about this book is it really, did, there's a lot of text here. It's, this isn't just a photo book. Um, there's a lot of contact sheets. Uh, I'm looking at one from 1953. Uh, 1959, I should say, contact sheet number 668, an autopsy and female impersonator's backside, um, backstage. Pardon? <laughs> Back- backstage. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you've got, you've got this is obviously a, a roll of film, right? So she, she's got a roll of film. These are the contact sheets from it. Half of it is uh, photographs of an autopsy, a real autopsy, and half of it is photographs of uh, female impersonators who are backstage in various states of um, undress. undress. <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea of the stuff that she'd be going through. Um, two ladies walking in Central Park. That's a very, very famous picture of hers. Um, just like they're both in black. They, they could be sisters. And they're just walking out of the hill, staring straight at her. 
Now, uh, you know, there's there's some quotes with some of these pieces of text as well. So I'll read out the one for that one with the ladies. Uh, it says, there, there are and have been and will be an infinite number of things on earth. Individuals all different, all wanting different things, all knowing different things, all loving different things, all looking different. Everything that has been on earth has been different from any other thing. That is what I love, the differentness, the uniqueness of all things and the importance of life. I see something that seems wonderful. I see the the divineness in ordinary things but that that's what we do as photographers isn't it we're collectors pictorial collectors yeah absolutely I, I often say to people anybody can be a photographer anybody can press the button and understand all of the you know the, the, the aperture and all that kind of stuff but uh, you know your own every single person is an observer a different observer yeah, yeah. and what interests them is different everybody is different as she just said um, yeah, I agree with you totally. I mean, this stuff is 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 just superb. It's a one really wonderful book, one something that you need to sit down and read, and and you can dig into it and stuff. Um, there's a picture on page two two seven, a um, an inadvertent double exposure of a self portrait. Um, so it's Times Square. She's taken a picture of uh, a stranger in Times Square. Mm. Um, you know, very very kind of fifties looking person with cigarette and stuff. And then there's the, the, the double exposure, which it says is inadvertent. But it, even that is amazing, you know. And, of course, remember it, this, the, the little contact sheet it shows from here, or the, the, the strip of film, uh, it says Kodak Tri-X film. So, uh, you know, she's using, obviously, um, Tri-X for most of the stuff, I think, in the, in the black and white elements of things, at least. <laughs> I, um, but, you know, getting getting a double exposure in, in film is tricky. It's yeah. tricky enough in digital. Yeah. Um, and getting one that was a mistake, but was still brilliant enough to put in a book. <laughs> there you go. That's talent, isn't <laughs> no, it? I know, it is. I, I got very Retired sad. man and his wife at home in a nudist camp. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, I'll leave that one up to your imagination. <laughs> There's um, a there's a gentleman and a lady. I'm looking for and, it. Uh, and um, yeah, oh. in a nudist camp. I got I got very excited for a moment there because I I was uh, looking at where you could possibly get the book and I found Waterstone seventy pounds. I thought there we go, steam in, buy it. No, it's um, unfortunately not available at the moment. They say. Mm, yeah. So there we go. Diane Arbus Revelations. Yeah. Uh, really wonderful book. Um, nice big heavy one. That one stayed in my studio. Oh, I'm just going to put it over. Was that another one that I was supposed to be getting for Christmas that I never got? <laughs> uh no maybe next year maybe, maybe next, next year, year. i'll uh, just double check it's not signed <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was telling sam that that and <laughs> she said well i don't blame him i'd have done the same <laughs> so so that was yeah. all right then um right back to questions um was it your turn i think it was i did the last one from jay griffer didn't i okay i've got one question this Go is on. more for you uh from Indy Lehman. Now, that's a cool name, isn't it? Indy Lehman. That's what I'm talking uh, about. In, yeah. Indy's been on the show before. Uh, and he says, with each of the Fujicast and Photography Daily podcasts, yeah. it is always mentioned that these shows are a loading zone production. <laughs> Can you please tell us a bit more about loading zone production and right. its role in your in production? My, in life. <laughs> that's my production company for, um, for podcasts. It's not a very big organization. It's actually very small at the moment. Um, but yeah, that that's simply it, really. Uh, loading zone, I think, because uh, I really like the loading zone signs that you find in America. I think that was it, really. And I thought it was like downloading, loading, loading zone, kind of downloading zone. I thought oh, there we go. That was that was the that was the purpose behind it. That and probably a bottle of Shiraz or something at the time when I was trying to think of a name. It makes us sound very professional, doesn't it? It does, yeah. But it makes you sound very professional, <laughs> well, I should say. Well, it is a production company, so, you know, um, it's it's a sound production company. That is it. Mm. It's no more complex than that. Um, question from Johan Borhead. Hi, guys. Kev, do you still use Exposure X6? And Neil, have you tried it? Well, the answer's no on that one. I'm fiddling around with Lightroom alternatives at the moment, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts about the latest version of Exposure? Question mark. It says, by the way, thanks for the great show. Looking forward to Mondays in a way I never have before. Thank you. For yeah, that. we haven't had many thanks up front uh, before the questions recently. No. Uh, I know we used to just jog over them. No, I know. Yada, 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 yada them. Stop, stop doing it because of the yada, yada, yada thing, probably. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's it. Come on, bring them back. <laughs> so do, do um, you use it? 
I do occasionally, yeah. Not not as much as I used to. I used to use it a lot, but primarily I used to use it for the the filters more than anything, rather than as a raw editor. Although it can, I think it was Exposure X4 where they it became an editor. Right. You can actually you know do a raw editing. But I do, I still do use Lightroom for all my raw editing, and I still sometimes dip into Exposure to do some of the the really nice black and white stuff they've got in there. But yeah. but you know I've got my my own kind of workflow for that stuff now. But it is a really really good application, and you for those that don't want you know i saw capture want to put their prices up recently and and you know lightroom obviously is subscription based and for people who don't want that perhaps then then exposure is something to look at it is it is very good one thing to be careful of with exposure though is well not careful is that it does take a little bit of time for it to catch up with latest cameras uh uh-huh. okay so, that yeah could be a disadvantage then i'm so far down the rabbit hole um, of using Adobe products now. I can never see myself coming out the other side, Kev, to be honest. Everything seems to be sort of, it all sort of talks to each other so well. Yeah, yeah. me too. I love it. I love Adobe stuff. But yeah, you know, horses for courses, sixes for sevens, eights for nines and tens and elevens. Oh, really? Oh, you've just reminded me. Let's see if you can do another one of these then. So, um, 4x <laughs> plus 15 equals x plus 3. What is x? Uh, what did you say? 4x Four Four, plus, plus 15 equals x plus 3. What is uh, x? It's going to be a negative number. Um, mm. I, uh, negative, uh, no, negative it's not. 4? No, it's not it's going to be a negative number. It's a positive number. No? 4x plus 15 equals x plus 3. Yeah. Well, the answer I've come to is x equals 4. X equals minus four, I think. Oh, does it? Oh, yeah. look, again, raise your glasses to Kev. <laughs> no, I might be wrong, though. <laughs> Back you of the class, play. James. All oh, right, sir. All we'll right. get Jack to find the answer. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I sound like I was in the same maths class to you. Um, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we had a teacher. I'm afraid I, I sort of got a bit... A bit sort of towed in with a with a with a uh, with a bad guys, I'm afraid, and uh, and so uh, poor old Mister, what was his name? Oh, I wish I could remember his name. We made his life a misery, I'm afraid. Um, we, do you remember the old sort of Victorian classes with the with the glazed brick uh, glazed bricks and the yeah. sing, and the single desks, which would have the ink thing in there? Yeah. So they were all perfectly lined up, and every time he would turn round to the uh, to the blackboard, we would trundle them forward, and he'd turn around and say, "Who's that?" Not me, sir. Not me, sir. It's like that Mr. Wolf game, isn't it? <laughs> and by the end of the class, he would be literally pinned against the blackboard by all these advancing desks. I can't remember. Oh, you little sod. I know. It was terrible. And I felt really, really bad. But if you didn't join... I didn't want to join in, Kev. But if you didn't join in, the, the bullies, they would get you, Kev. They would get you, they would. Afterwards. Come here. Anyway, that's it for this week's show. If you'd like to send in your questions, please do. Could do with a few more ones by email, by the way, to um, to click at fujicast.co.uk. If you want to send in your Facebook ones, how do you do it, Kev? Uh, go to the Facebook group and there is a pinned post that says questions for the show. That does not mean you cannot ask any other questions in the rest of the group, of course, but only the ones in the pinned pin post will we will feature. Brilliant. See you next week. Bye-bye, Kev. Bye. Bye-bye. The FujiCast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way. 